Hi, I'm Dr. Sharad Paul, and in an episode of Medical Mysteries, I normally bring you weird, wonderful, and wacky case histories from all around the world of medicine and from my own patients. Actually, I first started thinking about these cases when I had a patient who came to see me the other day at my skin practice. You know, as you know, I've always said in medical practice that you can't have bad health and good skin, and your skin just reflects what's going on underneath. And I could have sworn that this patient was a heavy drinker. He had a rhinopimatous nose, rosacea. He really had drinker's skin, but he denied drinking a drop of alcohol. Can you actually get drunk without drinking a drop of alcohol? Can your body become its own brewery? That's what we're going to find out in the two stories I'm going to tell you today. Case number one, an Italian-American gentleman, 45 years old, obese with a BMI of 35, with a medical history of high blood pressure, high cholesterol and diabetes. A few months earlier, he had undergone surgery for a deviated nasal septum, following which he was given some antibiotics. After this, he started developing an episode of slurred speech. His wife noticed that his breath was smelling of alcohol and he started feeling dizzy and he actually felt drunk and hung over in the mornings. Getting increasingly concerned even about his driving, he himself brought a breathalyzer to test himself. Few months passed and then he underwent dental surgery for which he was given more antibiotics. Following this, his symptoms got worse. He was increasingly slurring his speech. People said, look, have you been drinking? Even his wife suspected that he was a closet alcoholic. One day he was just driving to work and he was stopped by the police and he was found to have an alcohol level of 0.41%, which is five times above the American US alcohol limit of 0.08%. In other words, his blood alcohol is 410 milligrams per deciliter. The police didn't believe that he wasn't drinking. He was taken to the hospital and the doctors didn't believe that he hadn't been drinking. He was convinced that there was something going on with his body. His wife said, look, he's had this for a few months. We think it's something to do with his diet because certain foods he eats makes him drunker. So he was actually put in a room, the doors were shut and he was put on a carbohydrate challenge test. So people thought, let's just look at his diet and measure his blood alcohol levels. So the day went like this. In the morning, he had some beef empanadas. A couple of hours later, his blood alcohol was already above the legal level. In the afternoon, he had some chicken soup, which didn't actually push it up as much. In the evening, he had a carbohydrate snack, and guess what? Again, his blood alcohol was well above the legal limit. So he was diagnosed with autobrewery syndrome. But to confirm this, they did a series of tests. For example, his tools were analyzed using DNA and PCR, and they found it grew Saccharomyces cerevisiae, which we know is the brewer's yeast. His stool also contained the metabolites ethyl sulfate and ethyl glucuronide, which are actually things that are broken down when the body digests alcohol. So he was now diagnosed with auto-brewery syndrome. Case two was a 46-year-old gentleman, slightly overweight, body mass index of 30, no prior medical history, no medications, non-smoker, social drinker about a year ago, but he hadn't been drinking for over a year. It all started after he had a thumb injury. It's quite a complex injury of his thumb for which he needed antibiotics for quite a prolonged period. Following this, he said he started feeling foggy, depressed, didn't want to go to work, and he actually felt lousy, and he actually felt that it, like he had been drinking too much. He went to his doctor and his doctor said, look, you're depressed and referred him to a psychiatrist. And when he went to see the psychiatrist, as what psychiatrists do, he was put on some Prozac and Lorazepam. Well, that's what all psychiatrists do, don't they? Anyway, he was still convinced that something was going on in his own body and he, was, he had read about autobrewery syndrome. So he went to a hospital where he had heard that doctors had treated a previous case. The doctors thought that, you know, his work, he worked as a roofer repairing roofs after hurricanes and they weren't convinced that it was an auto brewery syndrome. So what they thought was perhaps there were some toxins because he was repairing roofs after hurricanes and what they found was they, they did a toxicology screen and the screen was fine. 
they did an endoscopy and they found that his gut grew Saccharomyces cerevisiae, the brewer's yeast, and also Candida albicans, another type of yeast. So they considered that he may have autobrewery syndrome and they ran a carbohydrate challenge test. Again, he was put on diets high in carbohydrates and hours later his blood alcohol levels were measured. And lo and behold, he also had autobrewery syndrome. So as way of treatment, they cultured uh, the fungi and they found they were sensitive to both groups of fungi, antifungal medications um, called azoles, and polyenes, which is like your fluconazole and nystatin, is given a course of each of these, following which his symptoms actually got better. But unknown to the doctors, he then went and had a big meal of pizza and soda, and once he had a high carbohydrate diet, his symptoms relapsed, and he went back, and he again felt drunk, and he was unwell, and he was slurring and driving erratically, and pulled over by the cops. Eventually, he was treated with an echinocand in a different group of antifungal, which is called mycofungin, on a longer course, and now he remains symptom-free. So what is autobrewery syndrome? It is where your own body starts producing its own alcohol, especially when related to high carbohydrate diets. So how do we treat autobrewery syndrome? If a patient came to your rooms and he denied drinking a drop of alcohol, so how do you treat autobrewery syndrome? Obviously, first you make the diagnosis, as we discussed, with a carbohydrate challenge test and measuring blood alcohols and culturing the stools. You put people on a low carbohydrate diet and typically on antifungals. The antifungals which have been shown to work are actually the polyenes like nystatin or azoles which are like fluconazole. And more recently, we've used echinocandins like mycofungin to treat. Of course, none of this will work if the patient doesn't go on a low carbohydrate diet. So now that we know this, it's actually fine in medical literature. There have been many other cases reported. In the 1970s in Japan, it was first reported, it was called Meitei Sho, which means auto-intoxication in Japanese. And they found that a group of people had been developing symptoms of intoxication without drinking. In the Middle East, where people, because of their faith, don't drink alcohol, they had reported they'd done as tes tests on 1,400 people and they found that significant proportion actually had alcohol in their system and therefore they also diagnosed autobrewery syndrome. Crazily, this is quite unknown in the world of medicine even today and that's one of the reasons I'm bringing you these case stories today. The typical patient of autobrewery syndrome is a male, 40 to 50, he is overweight, who's had a prolonged course of antibiotics, which have altered his intestinal flora. This is one of the reasons when we treat these patients, we not only give them antifungals, but we also give them probiotics. But sometimes your intestinal flora may be altered from other conditions, secondary causes such as Crohn's disease, causes strictures in your bowel, or you could have shortcut syndrome where a part of your bowel has been removed for other reasons. And any of these things can actually cause you to have altered bowel flora and put you at higher risk of getting an autobrewery syndrome. But nevertheless, in all these cases, even after treatment, one needs to maintain a low carbohydrate diet. To understand autobrewery syndrome and how your body becomes its own brewery, I'm going to have to give you a little lesson in beer making. How do you make beer? You take barley, you soak it overnight, just as it starts to germinate, you stop it from sprouting by either air drying it or you want to roast it more when it's called more malting in the process, where it becomes a darker kind of a beer. So the beers that are formed by yeasts which ferment at the top are your ales and the yeasts which ferment at the bottom make your lagers. So the first person to describe the yeast to make the lagers was, you know, Carlsberg or the famous Carlsberg Brewery. And he found that these yeasts actually, you know, uh, fermented at a lower temperature, like 35 to 50 degrees Fahrenheit. Louis Pasteur, of course, was a pioneer in the top dwelling um, yeasts. And so he described, you know, what was then called Saccharomyces pasteurensis. But now both these have been bundled into one category of brewer's yeasts and nowadays we simply call them as Saccharomyces cerevisiae. In all cases of um, 
auto brewery syndrome, we note that people tend to grow Saccharomyces cerevisiae in the bowel and in their stools. Candida albicans, the normal yeast that we grow, can also ferment at certain temperatures, but this is the main one. So the next time the police pull you over, you may well have an excuse if you have auto brewery syndrome. Well, it gives a whole new meaning to the word beer gut, doesn't it? If you like this episode, feel free to comment, follow us and do subscribe to the channel and do come back for more episodes. I'll see you next time.